collaborative. My name is Indrani, and I'm a senior at the Bergen County Academies. And I conducted my research for the last three and a half years on brain injury. So when I started high school, I realized I really liked biology. I wanted to use biology research techniques to tackle some problems in medicine that have no cure, have no solution. So I approached my research mentor, Mrs. Donna Leonardi, and she told me about a friend of hers who was suffering from ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. And she told me how debilitating the disease was, that there was no hope for like really a cure or even palliating the quality of life of someone who was suffering from that condition. And that was when I started my search on brain injury. Ironically, this was about five months before, if any of you remember, the start of the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. So I feel really lucky to have been working on this subject just at the time that it came into prominence. And I've seen a lot of other research that's just been coming up on ALS and brain injury and other brain diseases that really makes me excited to be working in this field. So what is brain injury? I'm sure you've all heard of conditions such as stroke, TBI, Alzheimer's, ALS. And what this really is, is a chemical or mechanical injury or insult to brain tissue. And what we commonly associate with injury to brain tissue is the death of neurons, these signal conducting cells that we associate with our nervous system function. So these neurons die, but in the background, there are supporting cells called glial cells that experience behavioral changes that can either contribute to or ameliorate the brain injury condition. So my research focuses on the behavioral change of astrocytes, a type of glial cell that undergo reactive astrogliosis in the presence of brain injury. These astrocytes grow, divide, and express certain molecules in response to these injury conditions. So what is reactive astrogliosis? When neurons are injured, they signal to healthy astrocytes, which undergo reactive astrogliosis and become reactive astrocytes. So you see these reactive astrocytes, they basically form a seal around these injured neurons after growing and dividing. And this is good, obviously, because it kind of sequesters the injury to one area. But at the same time, if reactive astrogliosis is prolonged or if it's severe, um, these reactive astrocytes start to misbehave. They secrete toxic chemicals, they cause neurons to die, and they inhibit the growth of neurites, which are basically the projections from the neuron body that are a major hallmark of neuron function. So my focus, my research focus is on reactive astrogliosis because if our ultimate goal is to save neurons and to keep neurons healthy in a disease condition, it's important to make sure the surrounding environment of the neurons is conducive to their growth. Otherwise, if you're simply trying to keep neurons alive in an environment where these reactive astrocytes are secreting toxic chemicals, that's literally the equivalent of trying to raise a bridge in a flood zone. So my goal essentially for my project is to clear this flood zone to kind of remediate cells surrounding injured neurons as a fix to brain injury. So the first question I asked in my research that is poorly understood by current literature is how do reactive astrocytes contribute to neuron death? Well, healthy astrocytes internalize glutamate, which is a chemical signal, which prevents glutamate from building up around neurons and causing toxicity, because glutamate in excess is toxic. My hypothesis was that reactive astrocytes would contribute to the death of neurons and damage by decreasing their uptake of glutamate. So glutamate would pile around the astrocytes and the surrounding neurons and cause further injury. So how did I test this hypothesis? Uh, for clarity and time, I'm going to keep it to the level of the experiments I conducted, and I can answer any questions later on specifically how I was measuring what I was measuring. The first thing I did is I made reactive astrocytes in cell culture, so basically in a petri dish, by treating healthy astrocytes with this chemical called TGF-beta-1. Then I grew my neurons along with my astrocytes and I took pictures of these neurites, these indicators of healthy neuron function, to see how my neurons were growing in my condition of reactive astrogliosis. So essentially, if I see more or longer neurites, I can tell that the neurons are functioning better. 
Then I took a step back and I treated just neurons with the fluid from the culture, the cell culture of my reactive astrocytes, essentially exposing these neurons to this kind of disease chemical state. And I call that reactive medium, the culture fluid of reactive astrocytes. And then I measured the livelihood of the neurons, their viability, whether or not they're alive or dead. And finally, I took this reactive medium, basically my disease chemical environment, and I measured levels of glutamate with the expectation that I'd see more glutamate in my reactive medium than the medium of healthy astrocytes. So what did I see? Well, uh, neurons that had been treated with this reactive medium died quite a bit. As you can see, there's a lot less viable neurons after treatment with the medium. And furthermore, you can see neurons that are grown with healthy astrocytes in the picture above. And you can see the red arrows pointing to all these neurites, these processes that are growing well. But in the bottom, when neurons are grown with reactive astrocytes, these processes are cut short. Essentially, what my results show is that um, astrocytes, when they're made reactive, contribute to neuron injury. So then I measured my glutamate uptake, and I found that there's a lot more glutamate piling around my reactive astrocytes, essentially. So my hypothesis was correct. Um, there is glutamate pooling around these reactive astrocytes that could possibly contribute to neuron toxicity. My next step was to find out how exactly do astrocytes decrease their glutamate uptake. We know this is a problem, but what is going wrong on behalf of the astrocytes to cause this? So there's one protein, EAAT2, which is the glutamate transporter in astrocytes responsible for taking up glutamate. And I believe that a decreased expression of EAAT2, the glutamate transporter, would lead to a decreased glutamate uptake in reactive astrocytes that would then allow glutamate to pool in neurons to die. So I tested that. I measured levels of EAAT2 in my ordinary and reactive astrocytes, and I found no change. Essentially telling me that reactive astrocytes express this glutamate transporter, but still there's glutamate pooling around the area. It's a bit of a conundrum because glutamate should not be pooling in the area if glutamate transporter is present. Leaving me with the question, if my reactive astrocytes are expressing normal levels of EAAT2, why is my glutamate uptake decreasing? So time to step back, revise my phase two, um, what could be the real reason that astrocytes are not taking up glutamate? So I found that EAAT2 was present in reactive astrocytes, but I hypothesized that this EAAT2 may not be present at the cell membrane. If EAAT2 delocalizes from the astrocyte membrane and moves into the cell, as you saw in the animation, this could equally impair glutamate uptake because the transporter is not functioning where it needs to be functioning, essentially leading to glutamate pooling around the astrocytes and contributing to neuron death. So to test this hypothesis, I took reactive astrocytes and I fluorescently stained the cell surface for this protein. And then I measured this in two ways. First, I put the stained astrocytes into essentially a laser it's called a flow cytometer, and I measured kind of the scatter to quantify how much of this protein was at the surface. And I took the same sample, or pretty much the same sample, and threw it under the microscope to see, are my samples glowing? Essentially, is there this protein present? And this is what I found. Um, in the figure above, you can see that in healthy astrocytes, there's a much greater amount of positive cells that are expressing this protein which correlates to a visible stain. Essentially, you're seeing a stain of this protein, EAAT2, at the membrane of my healthy astrocytes. On the other hand, in my reactive astrocytes, you can see there are like maybe 5% cells positive for EAAT2, which correlates with a weak stain once these cells are under the microscope. Essentially, no green, a faded background, a wiped out signal tells me that although EAAT2 is present, in reactive astrocytes, this EAAT2 is moving away from the cell membrane. Another reason for glutamate to pile up around my astrocytes. So I defined a problem. Um, glutamate pooling around astrocytes is potentially toxic to neurons. And this happens because the glutamate transporter of astrocytes moves away from the cell membrane in an injury condition. It's pretty depressing. <laughs> 
So um, I turned around, I tried to find a solution to that. And my objective here was to repair this glutamate uptake. And I decided to do this by restoring healthy neuron to astrocyte signaling. In the first slide, we talked about astrogliosis as essentially a response of astrocytes to neurons and injury signals. So neurons are injured, and these neurons are the ones signaling to the astrocytes to come to the area and behave the way they are. What I did is I tried to restore the healthy signal instead of like the disease signal to kind of push the astrocytes to um, restore their glutamate uptake. So what did I use for this? I used um, a complex called exosomal microRNA 124A. It's not studied much, but it was shown as a healthy homeostatic neuron to astrocyte signal that increases the expression of EAAT2, my target protein. And what this complex breaks down into is a microRNA that upregulates EAAT2 through some unknown mechanism, as well as exosomes, these small vesicles that are essentially the carrying vehicle of my treatment, the 124A, that are able to cross the blood-brain barrier and could, in the future, possibly serve as a therapy, a vessel of therapy, um, if this uh, complex were to work. So what did I do? I took healthy astrocytes, I transfected them with a DNA plasmid for this 124A. And as my control, I had an empty plasmid without the 124A that I transfected as well. So you'll see that referred to as PCMVMER, my empty vector. So then I harvested exosomes for my transfected and my empty vector PCMVMER astrocytes. And this was essentially my treatment. I treated reactive astrocytes with my exosomes, and I compared the effects essentially on this entire injury condition I had established before. Um, the expression of glutamate transporter, the uptake of glutamate, whether or not neurons can survive in the medium and around these treated reactive astrocytes. So the first thing I found, which was expected from prior literature, is that my exosome treatment increases the expression of this glutamate transporter. So now there's more glutamate transporter in my reactive astrocytes. This wasn't conclusive evidence for any kind of treatment though, because I didn't know if this increase in EAAT2 would actually increase glutamate transport, which is the essential. So I tested glutamate transporter after the same treatment, and I found that there's a lot less glutamate piling around reactive astrocytes that had been treated with my exosomal 124A. Essentially, glutamate is disappearing from the surroundings, which implies that there is more glutamate transporter present at the cell membrane. Remember, I previously showed that if glutamate transporter is not at the cell membrane, glutamate will not be transported. Therefore, by reestablishing glutamate transport, my data essentially implies that there is more glutamate transporter present at the cell membrane of reactive astrocytes after my treatment. And finally, for kind of the real test, um, are neurons surviving in my injury and treatment model? Because this is what we want. We want neurons functioning, we want them surviving and signaling to each other in a healthy way. This is kind of the crux of brain injury treatment. So I did the same experiment as before. I took the medium off of my reactive astrocytes, my reactive medium, after those astrocytes had been treated with my exosomes. And I found that this medium was much healthier to neuron survival, much more conducive to neuron survival. As you can see, there are far more neurons surviving in my treated reactive medium than there are in my diseased samples. And it has a similar effect, my treatment, on the growth of the neurites, these processes of neurons. As you can see, these are neurons grown on my reactive astrocytes with my control treatment that have fewer neurites and basically blunted processes, kind of like what you saw in my disease picture before. But after my treatment, you can see this healthy, reestablished neurite growth that is kind of a hallmark of neuron signaling and neuron health. So in a nutshell, um, it's the picture's cut off, but after my reactive astrocytes are treated with my exosomal microRNA 124A, 
essentially the strain on the neurons due to a toxic chemical environment is relieved. So, all in all, I found that reactive astrocytes contribute to neuron damage through impaired glutamate uptake, which results not from the downregulation of my glutamate transporter, but its delocalization away from the cell membrane. And I treated this condition with this complex exosomal microRNA-124A, which increases EAAT2 expression and repairs glutamate uptake, which implies the relocalization of EAAT2 at the cell membrane, and ultimately increases the survival and function of neurons in the surroundings, essentially providing a complete picture of how I went about um, providing for neuron um, therapy in a model of brain injury. So what do I want to do next? I have a several critical questions that I want to answer in coming years. First of all, how does microRNA-124A upregulate EAAT2 in astrocytes? This is not something we know. Um, this is something I have to use through computational and or uh, microarray technology um, to kind of answer, which I believe I could use in establishing a therapeutic healthy signaling pathway that might be kind of like the goal to achieve in any kind of brain injury treatment. And secondly, I want to understand how 124A interacts in a more complex model of astrogliosis when there are other cell types, other types of glial cells, and other chemical factors present that could be changing the whole scene that we saw here. And finally, can I use this treatment in a mouse model of a specific type of injury, ALS, Alzheimer's, stroke? And will this treatment provide a similar therapeutic effect in any or all of those as I saw in a very generic but fundamental model in cell culture? And this hopefully is the track for finding a therapy for brain injury, one of my goals. Thank you. I'll take any questions now. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, first question. First question. Yes. Uh, how's it going? I'm Kirill Kovetsky from Tom River High School East. And I was wondering, so, so you developed a technique for relocalization of the protein? In a nutshell, yes. Okay. That is what I believe. Have you, have you considered investigating the cause of the delocalization? I and have. And then uh, as a, I guess, uh, to determine a preventative measure that could be taken so that these injuries don't arise in the first place? Absolutely. It's definitely one of those very elusive but very fundamental things like why is my protein moving away from the cell membrane. Um, my hypothesis or my hunch, I don't have much to support this, is that there's an intersection between glutamate, this excited toxic molecule, piling up around my cells and that um, transporter moving away, kind of like a negative response to a stress stimulus. Now, this whole pathway functions in a very, very vicious cycle and it's very difficult to isolate exactly where the beginning and end is. It seems like one thing, you know, glutamate piling up around the cells would cause an increase in the transporter, but instead it does the opposite. And when that transporter moves away, there's still more glutamate piling up. So it's one of those detrimental positive feedback loops that kind of just sets itself in motion and we don't really know how. And I believe by setting up that healthy signaling pathway, I might be able to understand what goes wrong in the disease signaling pathway that kind of causes that whole moving away from the cell membrane conundrum. Thanks so, so much. No All right, thank you. Uh, next question. Next question, next question. Yes, in front. Oh, we have a question. No, that's all right, You're, you can go. Hello. Um, in the beginning of your exp uh, presentation, it said you measured uh, neuron viability. How did you do that? Um, so I use a thing called an MTS assay, where basically um, you have this chemical you apply to a plate of cells, and the cells reduce, uh, live cells reduce that chemical into, um, I think it's MT tetrazoleum, 
or something like that that essentially emits a color. So you have a color that correlates the amount of live cells you have, and once you measure that color, you can kind of get a ratio of, oh, there are more live cells here that are producing this colored compound that's absorbing more light than there are here where there's dead cells and this color is not being produced. All right, thank you. Next question. Nicely done. Thank you. Uh, in your research, I never heard the term, you mentioned neurites. Mm -hmm. um, looking at some other research that's related to uh, brain research, brain um, injuries, I came across something that's called dendritic spikes. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with that? Or could you possibly, for future research, look into that as a possible I am, solution? definitely. And I would probably need a little more high resolution imaging and a better technique of staining. Since the neurites you saw, I actually did this membrane labeling technique where I kind of just stained the cell membrane with like this red little chain, this aliphatic chain, and then I kind of threw it under um, a fluorescent microscope. And I think if I had a little higher resolution imaging, as well as a non, like the neuron cell line I used was an established cell line, so if I were able to use a primary culture uh, from a mouse brain, that would definitely be the thing I'm looking for. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, next question. Okay, uh, oh yes, right here. Where did the neurons that you used for this research actually come from and how were they similar or different from human neurons? Um, so these are human neuroblastoma cells that are an established cell line by the American Type Culture Collection. Um, they're available for commercial purchase. Uh, these different differ from actual neurons in the sense that they're not fully differentiated. Essentially, that would throw a bit of a confounding variable in some of my studies where I kind of grew the neurons with the astrocytes. But at the same time, they were susceptible to the effects of glutamate buildup and their neurite measurements, which I detected. And um, that's kind of essentially what I was testing for, the possibility of neuron toxicity and neuron survival that could be similarly reflected in this kind of separate cell line. Also, how many trials were run and did you use any sort of statistical analysis to determine if your results were actually significant and not just a difference shown through your graphs? Absolutely. So in terms of the trials that were done, it differs for each experiment. Um, for the glutamate assay, I was able to only do it once because it was such an expensive assay to conduct. Um, and the exosome isolation, harvesting the exosomes was a very lengthy and difficult process. So wherever I had to use the exosomes, I didn't replicate too many times. But the relationships I found in my trials that I did with multiple tests, obviously, um, was strong enough. I used a student's t-test, uh, unpaired, two tails, for all of the significance tests done. The mean, the error bars you saw are basically the average plus or minus the standard deviation I got. Um, so essentially, based on the strength of those relationships I found, I presented my data as well as possible. Thank you. Um, All right, thank you. Any other questions? Oh, yes, we have one right here. It's all right. In using the microRNA 124, I do believe, how do you plan on implementing that into using that as a treatment plan? Like, are you going to use that through, like, blood injections, like using like a UV type thing, or how are you going to use that specifically? It would most likely, so this actually, exosomes, so we talked about exosomes crossing the blood-brain barrier, um, and that being the reason why I could use an exosome treatment as a possible therapy, and that actually hasn't been done. Um, there are really no clinical trials right now on how we would be using exosomes in, say, animals or humans. Um, so my best guess is that I would use a blood vessel, an injection, possibly something that has direct blood flow to the brain, so maybe a carotid artery. Um, basically, you can do an insection into the carotid artery and essentially slide up a catheter there. Um, and that would be probably one of the fastest ways to reach the brain. Um, it's not all that invasive. I know it sounds invasive, but it's not too bad. Um, that would be my best guess of where to start. I have one more question. Sure. Um, do you you know of any negative effects that the RNA strain can have on the body or cell reproduction or anything like that? This RNA strain specifically? Yeah. Um, I have not heard of it. I may have read something about its upregulation in liver cancer maybe, 
So definitely there would be an issue of testing its toxicity to other cell types, but then also if there's a way to direct flow to the brain rather than outside, that would be a good way of avoiding other types of toxicity. But there's definitely a lot of other phases of how safe is this to use that would be necessary. Thank you. No problem. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Questions, Quest going once, going twice. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so I have one administrative comment and a public service announcement.